10. We made it. 10 weeks. Anybody been here for all 10? Yeah, come on, guys. Good job. I'm proud of you. That's me too. Um, so, so fantastic. What a journey we've been on and, and, and so incredible to be able to just unpack these 10 commandments. And then the next thing we're going to be doing next week, we're starting the series called Outpouring that you just heard about. And we're going to be really just pressing into God. We're going to be um, just believing for an outpouring as we turn toward uh, what the Bible says and uh, about the Holy Spirit and how He can move and be in our lives. And we're also not only just doing uh, an outpouring series in all of our services, but in every Sunday night at all of our locations, we're going to be holding revival nights where we're just going to be believing for a move of God. And uh, I'm just trusting and, and I just know and so expect that God is going to do something. And I just want to encourage you as a church to do one thing for me. And whether you're watching online, because we're going to be doing this online as well, I want to encourage you to just spend more, a bit more time, do something different. So make a change in your usual routine, in your quiet time, where maybe you could, maybe God could challenge you to do some fasting, whatever it might be, do, make a change that causes you to press in a little bit more that causes you to dig a little bit deeper and believe God for more in your life. And if you are struggling to see God move in your life, can I just encourage you to believe again for the, for the month of August that you're gonna see him make a breakthrough, yeah? Come on, We're, I'm excited about it and I'm just believing for God to move. So here we are on the last week of our series and we have reached number one in our list of commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. And as we look at this commandment, in light of all the other commandments, I've learned something this week. I've learned something. See, here's what I've learned. We, in today's time and culture, we tend to think of our obedience to God and our relationship with Him as a very personal thing. We think of it as a personal and private subject. We even make you close your eyes for the salvation prayer because we see it in, our society, in today's society and culture as a private and personal thing. But the Israelites actually thought of faith as being very communal. And so when God laid these 12, these 12 commandments out before them and invited them into a covenant relationship with Him, when he, when he was teaching them about what it meant to live life in relationship with Him, they were not thinking of it as simply their relationship with God. No, this actually meant that they were entering into a, a relationship and a covenant with each other as well. It was a, it was a community project and it wasn't just about a commitment to God. It was also about a commitment to each other, which explains why we, we notice that command, in commandment 2 through 10 is all underpinned by command 1. Command 1 is the foundation upon which every other command is built upon. See, the first five commandments focus our attention on our worship, our commitment, and our protection of our relationship with God right? It talks about not having any gods or any idols above God. It talks about the Sabbath, which is about making God the Lord of our time. It's also about uh, showing God that we trust Him in all things, that we trust Him in all times. We trust Him enough to rest, knowing He will provide. The commandment about honoring your mother and father was also about our relationship with God. See, the commandment about honoring your mother and father was not just about being obedient to your parents so that you can live a long life as an individual. No, it was about passing on the ways of God from one generation to the other so that the Israelites might remain in the land that God, that God was giving them so that they wouldn't be exiled because of their disobedience, but that, so that generation after generation, they could live under the covenant and in the land that God was giving them. The first five are about our worship and our protection of our commitment to God. The next five, the final five, are about our love and our protection of our commitment to our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Take a look at them. We, we protect their property by not stealing it. We protect their marriage by not committing adultery. We protect their life by not taking it. We protect their reputation by not lying about them and so on and so on. It's also really important when we look at this one command to take a look at where in time and history we find it. 
we need to look at the context that it was given. So let me take you back now to when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. Remember that they had been under the iron rule of Pharaoh, and they had been this way in slavery for over 400 years. That's generation after generation after generation of slavery. And then God speaks to a man named Moses, who was an Israelite that grew up as an Egyptian prince. And God asks him, to, to lead the charge in setting his people free. And so Moses, we know the story, he goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no, and then God sends what? 10 plagues, 10 plagues to sweep through the land of Egypt. There were plagues of blood, frogs, gnats, flies, the death of livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and the plague of the firstborn. Now here's what's really interesting about these plagues. For every plague that God sent, there was an Egyptian god associated with that plague. There were Egyptian gods known as the guardian of the river source. There was a frog goddess. There was a god of the earth. There was a fly god of Egypt. There were gods associated with bulls and cows. There was a goddess of epidemia and, he and healing. There was a sky goddess, a deity from protector from locusts, sun gods, and then there was Pharaoh himself. Ten plagues. Ten gods. For every plague that swept through Egypt, Almighty God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Israelites, was trying to say to them, I am the God above every other God. I am more powerful. I have more authority. I am the God above every other God. And then God leads them out of Egypt into the wilderness to a mountain named Sinai, where he gives them the Ten Commandments. And the opening line is this, Exodus 20, verse 2, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. It's really important that we understand where in the timeline God gave this command, because we have to understand that God had already rescued the Israelites. In other words, these commandments were not their ticket to salvation. He had already redeemed them from their position of slavery. These commandments were not given so that they could be saved, no. Instead, he was gathering them together, his people, and he was teaching them how to be a new nation, no longer a slave nation. Think, they had knew nothing else but how to live as slaves, but now he needed them to know how to live as people of God. And these commandments were teaching them what it meant to, to live like a redeemed people. Each command showing them this is what it means to live like a son, a daughter of the most high God. And this is true for you and I. We have to understand today as we come to the end of these commandments that these commandments are not our ticket to salvation. These commandments are not the way we are redeemed. He, through Christ, He has already rescued us, already redeemed us. These commandments simply show us how to live as sons and daughters of the Most High King. These commandments simply teach us how to live as a people of God, and it all starts with knowing and loving God first. Our first, first duty, first and foremost, is to worship God and God alone. No other gods, either by our own making or borrowed from our neighbor. We learned last week, and number two, do you remember we talked about having no idols? And we learned last week from Steve that it's really easy for us to give something else the place in our life that belongs to God and God alone. Anything that we esteem or love, anything that is feared or served, anything that is delighted in or dependent on more than God can so quickly become a God in your life. Social media, work, even exercise or the gym, our relationships, our career, coffee, <laughs> ambition, money, your car, your home, your boat, your image, your clothing, even your family. And so today, we want to answer the question, how can we keep command number one and know and love God first? I've got three things. The first thing is this, we worship. We worship. First and foremost, our first, our, our first response and a direct response 
of what God has done in our life is worship. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Therefore, I will give my worship. I will give my worship. He is the Lord my God. He brought me out of hopelessness. He brought me out of the pit. He saved me. He redeemed me. He's rescued me. He's given me hope. He's given me purpose. He's given me a name. He's called me by name. Therefore, I will worship God and God alone. It is this act of worship that re- expresses our reverence and our adoration for Him. The trouble is, is that there is a whole lot of stuff that we so often put before worshiping God. There are so many things. How many times do we find ourselves trading on our time with God? We trade it in for other things. We think, oh, I should be setting aside this amount of time, but when I hit the snooze button, I'm trading off sleep for my time with God, right? I'm trading off my time with God for more sleep. And so many times, how many times do we trade off going to church with smashed avo on toast for brunch on a Sunday morning? How many times do we trade off getting up and actually attending church with late night watching Netflix and then being too tired to get out of bed? How many times do we trade off a a good quality time with God in the morning because we hit the snooze button way too many times? Now, often it's taught that, uh, and we've probably heard it teach, taught many, many times, that our worship can be multiple things, lots of different things. Our worship might be expressed in our giving. Our worship might be expressed in serving God with our gifts. Our worship can be expressed in how we love others, how we speak um, toward others. Our worship can be expressed in so many different ways. And that is still the case. But today, on this commandment, and when it comes to this commandment in particular, I just need to let you know that there is no substitute for worship that comes out of your mouth in prayer and song. There is no substitute for declaring and exalting and magnifying the name of God. The very act of worship positions Him in that place of number one in your life because it is the act of worship that glorifies Him, that speaks of His greatness, His bigness, His authority in your life. It speaks of His power when you sing to him. And so while, yes, all the other things might be an act of worship, there is one thing we just cannot give up doing, and that is the declaration of praise and worship from our mouth, whether it's in prayer or whether it's in song. (laughs) Isaiah 25 verse 1, O Lord, I will honor and praise your name. You are my God. Psalm 145 verse 3, great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. You want to keep command number one? You want to know and love God first? Then we need to keep a daily habit of worship, a daily habit of worship. Okay, number two, here we go. We need to draw nearer. We need to draw nearer. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt Out of the land of slavery, have no other gods before me. I am the Lord your God. Now, you might notice, and hopefully, perhaps in the translation of Bible that you read, because it's not, they don't have it in all translations, but in in some of the more traditional translations, you'll notice that in not all times, but in particular times, that word Lord is written with all capitals. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And when you see it written with all capitals, it means it's different to when you see it written with just a capital L. See, when it's written with all capitals, it's not referring simply to the Lord of a house or the Lord of a place or someone who is in charge of something, as in the general meaning of the word Lord that you would um, see often or be most familiar with. No, Lord, all caps, is God's personal name. It's his name. And when we translate it to an English word or we try and say the the name from its original language, the only thing we can come up with is Yahweh. It actually doesn't even really have, and originally it doesn't really have any any vowels. It's just got, so it's, it's 
it's how, how do you say a word with no vowels? And so we say in our English language, Yahweh. It's God's personal name. You ever known someone important? Like I'm talking real important, like someone with like a big title or someone who's like super famous or super in charge of lots of things. And they, you, you're on a first name basis with that person. That makes you feel important, right? I mean, when you get to be on a first name basis with someone who seems to us significant, with a title or some kind of celebrity status, like when you're on a first name basis, like you are in, you're like, the, you're like tight, like tight, like, ooh, okay, first name basis, right? You feel important yourself when you're on a first name basis with someone who you believe is important. I want, to know, I want you to know today that when God uses his personal name in this command, he is showing us that he is a personal God. Friends, it's first name basis status for you and God. He's saying, I want you to use my personal, I want you to use my first name now uh, when it comes to my relationship with you. He is not setting himself off at a distance. He is not saying, I am going to stay, I'm going to be far and stay far from you. No, he is not a God that doesn't want to be known or spoken to. He tells us his name. He tells us his name. He wants to be known by you and he wants to know you and he wants to be near. He wants to be near. And if we are gonna keep command number one and know and love him first, we must draw near to the God who draws near to us. We've gotta stay close because proximity is everything. Our older son Judah went on a sports camp for school a few months ago. And he went, and the camp was about two hours away, and he doesn't have a cell phone. Um, long may that continue. So we, uh, we, much to his dismay, I'm sure. Um, so he didn't go, he didn't have a device that he could keep in contact with, with us with, and we weren't able to go and visit him at all. I have to tell you, it was torture. The distance, the silence was torture. I wanted to know all the things, you know? Like, I wanted to know, who is he talking to? Who's he sharing a cabin with? What's he eating? How many times is he changing his undies? Like, is he having a shower? What, like, how are the, how are the sports going? Is he winning? Has he hurt himself? Does he need his inhaler? Like, all the things that a mum wants to know, I had no idea, and so I was just left wondering. The silence was deafening, as they say. Proximity is everything. Be near. It means prioritizing your time with God. Regular time with God, not once in a while when I can be bothered, I'll squeeze it in. I mean like every day, short accounts with the Lord, connecting with Him time. It means including God in everything, having the long conversations and the short conversations. It means letting Him in on every detail, the big stuff, the small stuff, and everything in between. Proverbs says the Lord directs the steps of the godly and He delights in every detail. He delights in every detail. When Judah came home from camp, you best believe I wanted every single detail. That's hard to get out of a teenage boy. I wanted every detail. Right, how, how did it go? What did you do? What did you do on Monday? What did you do on Tuesday? What did you do on Wednesday? What did you have for dinner? How many times did you shower? Who, ha, whose cabin did you sleep in? Like, <laughs> I wanted to know absolutely everything. I delighted in every detail. And the Lord does the same with us. And I know how small and simple and ridiculous this might sound. But when you come back to the first commandment, the heart of it is that God's desire is to be close. His desire is to be close to you, to know you, to spend time with you. And if we miss that, then we miss the whole point of commandment number one. Right. All through Exodus, we read phrases like, keep to my commands, do not depart from me, right? Do not turn away from me. What's he saying? He's saying, don't move away. He's saying, stay close, stay near. All throughout scripture, everything he did, he did to be near us. Jesus coming was about God wanting to be near. Right. Emmanuel, God with us, walking in the flesh, was near. Christ dying on the cross was the ultimate act of God wanting us to be able to be near. The gift of the Holy Spirit was God wanting to be near. Right. 
We are about to start a new series, The Outpouring, where we're going to seek God for a move, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And now we can believe, we can stand there and we can believe for God for an outpouring. We can believe for a move of the Holy Spirit. We can go to the revival nights, but it's nothing. It all comes down to nothing if we don't know Him. If we don't know him, remember the conversation that Jesus had in Matthew 7, where he said, on, um, on that day, people will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Didn't I go to the revival nights, Lord? Didn't we do an outpouring series? Didn't I pray this? Didn't we see that? But did you know him? Signs, wonders, miracles, mighty works are nothing if we don't know Him. You want to keep command number one? To know and love God first, you got to draw near. You have to draw near. And number three, the third and final thing, and I'm going to ask the band to come and join me now. We need to trust in His providence and provision. We need to trust in His providence and His provision. So you ever eaten? at a takeaway place, and you've ordered your meal and sat down to eat, but the friend that you are with wants to eat with you, but doesn't want to eat that food. So they go to the takeaway place next door, they get a place from a different place, and then they bring that meal into the establishment that you are sitting down to eat. And so everybody else has the food from that establishment, Meanwhile, someone else is sitting there eating something else. I can't cope. I cannot sit there. I, my, it, it sends my real following tail into a spin. I cannot cope. I, 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 I feel offended for, for, you know, you cannot come in here bringing your Burger King into McDonald's. I feel offended on Ronald's behalf. It's like, you want a burger? I make burgers. I'm the king of burgers. Like everything you need, I have. But you think, oh, it's not gonna fulfill you, so you go off and find Burger King? I'm McDonald's, I'm the king of Burger, I'm the, I'm the OG. But you know, there we, think we, we have to think we have to go outside the thing to get what, I can't handle it. Here's the thing, we fall into this trap in our lives. We fall into this trap of breaking this command, whenever we look outside of God's provision and protection and care for the things the world is offering. When we think, when He has all we need and yet we still think we need more. I'm talking about anything outside of God that we put our trust in or we look to for fulfillment, happiness and ultimately provision. And the Israelites fell into that sinking sand time and time again. They grumbled and they complained. They moaned and they groaned. They ignored God's instructions. They went the opposite way. They didn't believe, so they disobeyed. They made threats. They second guessed. And at the heart of it all was that they did not trust and that God would provide and protect and care for them. They didn't trust that He was God over all. Where are you putting your trust today? Do you trust that when He says He's the God of all gods, that He really is? Do you trust that He is the God over your situation that you have been praying for for months? Do you trust that He is God over your health that you have been battling with? Do you trust that He is the God over your marriage that has hit rock bottom? Do you trust that He is God over your career that you have been striving to climb the ladder of? Do you trust that He's the God of your future, the God of your home, the God over your finances, the God over your dreams, the God who'll meet your every need in your life? Is He really the God above every other thing. I am the Lord your God, the God who found you, saved you, and called you by name. 
the God who picked you up, healed you, and gave you a purpose. The God who loved you, never left you, and provides your every need. The God who rescued you, believed in you, and the God who set you free. You shall have no other gods before me. Come on, if we wanna keep command number one, know and love God first, we have to worship. Worship. We have to draw nearer and we have to trust. Trust in His provision, trust in His providence. He wants to protect and care for you. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Oh God, we're so thankful that you redeemed us and you've rescued us. Lord, you've saved us. We thank you for that. God, we thank you that where we are now is not where we were before. That you are a God who can transform lives. And so this day, we say you are God above it all. And right now, whatever is going on in our lives, God, we surrender it to you. And we magnify you above every other thing. We magnify you above our problems. We magnify you above our successes. We magnify you above our failures. We magnify you above our health problems, above our marriages. We magnify you in our jobs, in our schools. We magnify you, Lord, in this church. We magnify you in our community. And Lord, we magnify You over this nation. And right now, Lord, we say that we are a church who is willing to stand and say that we will fight and, and acknowledge and declare that You are the God above every other God. And we will worship You day in and day out. And we will draw nearer to You that we might know You. And we will trust that You are a God who wants to love and provide for His kids. I wanna pray one more prayer today and just wanna invite you with your head still bowed and your eyes closed. You know, I've talked about a God who loves and cares for you. A God who has the power to rescue you out of your circumstance. And right now, there are people in the room and watching online and you're saying, I need to be rescued, man. I need to be rescued. My life is so far from God, I'm stuck. I'm stuck where I am. And I need, I need, I need, I need God to my life today. Well, He loves you and He created you to have a relationship with Him. And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer in just a moment because we all walk away from God. We all turn our backs on Him. We try and define good and evil for ourselves. And the Bible calls that sin. We make mistakes and it separates us from God. But I wanna tell you today that He sent His Son, Jesus, to live a sinless life on earth and die a sinner's death so that He could pay the debt that you and I were due for our sin and so that we could live in relationship with Him. And I'm gonna pray a prayer in just a moment. I'm inviting every single one of you to pray this prayer with me. You can pray it in your heart. You don't have to pray it out loud, but I really encourage you to make it your own prayer. Are you ready? We say, dear Jesus, Thank you that you went to the cross for me. Thank you that you paid the debt that I was due. Thank you that you have forgiven me today. I acknowledge that I am a sinner and I need a Saviour. Thank you that I can find new life in you. Thank you for the plans and the purposes that you have for me. I choose this day to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. With every head still bowed and eye closed, I would love to be able to see who I prayed for today. All you have to do, and you can do this online as well, there's a button coming up, it says I raise my hand. All you have to do is on the count of three, just lift your hand nice and high, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, I'll put it straight back down, I'm not gonna make you stand up, I'm not gonna call you to the front. Are you ready? Come on, let's do this together. One, two, three. You can lift your hand now. You're saying, Bex, would you count me in on that prayer? Awesome, 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 awesome. Yes, thank you. I see you. Yeah, see you down the back. Thank you, both of you. Anybody else, you're saying, Bex, can you count me in on that? I prayed that prayer. I'm saying yes to God online. I see you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much that you're a God who takes a broken life and you can make it whole again. God, I thank you for these people who have who have made that decision today. And God, we thank you for the plans and the purposes that you have for them, for the future and the new life that you have for them. And Lord, right now, we praise you and we celebrate you in Jesus' Name. Come on, church. Can you celebrate? Thank you, Lord.